thanks a lot. I think by now everyone's awake. Hello. <laughs> um, breaking out of serial execution. We've, for those of you who have been in the talk before this talk, we've been talking about threading and um, very sort of low level CPU level scaling. Um, I take this whole notion now to, to the next step and talk about scaling web applications um, onto many servers, onto um, architectures that are significantly bigger than a single CPU with many cores. Um, why would I be the one to talk about it? Um, I currently, just a moment. Darn. Um, I currently uh, run a little startup called I Want My Name that does domain name registration out of Wellington. Um, we target the global market mainly in the US. I also run a little consulting shop called Springtime Soft. And um, I used to run um, startups in, in Europe before I came to New Zealand. Um, the most significant one was probably a, a domain registrar that we scaled from about 10,000 domains when I started to about a million in five years. So massive growth, a lot of parallel execution, a lot of servers, a lot of hosting stuff going on, and a lot of growth that deprecates code, not in years, but in months. So um, a lot of assumptions that I made didn't hold up over the years. and. Uh, I'm now at a stage where I think I know roughly what scaling is about in the moment. That doesn't hold up for the next years, I'm pretty sure. But for the moment, it looks roughly like this, um, how I line it out in that code in a moment. So serial execution. The problem that we have with um, serial execution is it doesn't scale. We run only as fast as our hardware can get us, and we can't go any faster because how? If it is one execution path, we are exactly limited to that one execution path. This is roughly how just stop code, don't try to run it somewhere. Um, we pass a request, we ask a database for something, we wait for the response, uh, we scale some image and we wait for the response, we call some external API, and we wait for the response, and somewhere when we've done all that stuff, we render a page. That's serial execution, as it's normally done in web applications in a moment. Um, the problem is someone, your marketing guy, will come to you and tell you, our page rendering times went up and that kills our, um, kills our customer perception on the site and that kills our re revenues and make that smaller. The problem is, the very same guy told you to call those thousand external APIs minutes before. So they don't know what they want, but they know exactly what they don't want, and that's the problem. So how do we deal with that? Um, interpreted languages, uh, I've talked about that in my previous talk, are normally single-threaded. They have one execution path. There are no background paths. There is no sort of... Um, way to just say, let's do this and this and this, and um, when you're all done, tell me that you're done, and uh, then we go on with our business. So there is no, no real way to actually kick off multiple processes while you're, um, while you're running through uh, an iterative um, path in your, in your code base. So we came up with a couple of um, different approaches to, to solve that problem. The, one that is very prominent is just client sites. We, we don't want to do it server sites. It's too hard. Uh, let's le let it do the client. And um, we have those wonderful pages that sort of render an empty page, and then something pops up here, and pops up here, and pops up here, and pops up here. And somewhere after a couple of minutes, hopefully probably a couple of seconds, um, you have a page that's actually rendered. Probably changes the layout three or four times during that period. But um, you, 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 you definitely have that problem no longer on the, on the server side, you have that problem on the client side and your marketing guy is probably happy-ish. Um, the other way is to do it on a server, which is a bit harder, but um, brings you a lot further. And uh, the server side is either message queues or uh, gearman or any of the other ways to actually parallelize tasks on, on your server. And I'll talk especially about the first one, the message queuing. Let's look briefly why I think that client sites is, is a really bad idea. Client sites 
means that you do not one request to render your page, but you do actually 20 requests to render your page. And those 20 page uh, requests are fine as long as your server is not busy. But that day where you get that big blog post, um, everyone's hammering your page. And your traffic is suddenly 20 times the traffic that you would have with, with a server-side scaling mechanism. And um, that is exactly the DDoSing yourself problem. Um, you, you have a really, really bad customer experience for all, a lot of uh, customers that hit your page for the first time ever. They don't know anything about you. They want to see a page quickly. So they hit your page and nothing or an empty site with no, nothing or really only basic information in it. So in order to, to avoid the problem that you have, that you DDoS yourself basically or have a really bad customer experience when you actually need it because it's a lot of traffic that you get that you can't convert otherwise. Um, in order to avoid that, I think client side scaling is suboptimal at best. Which leaves us with server sites. It's harder, I uh, have to admit, but it is, it's getting you way, way, way further. And I'll talk about why. So if we, if we don't look at scaling whatsoever and just look at large-scale architecture meetings in some corporate business, I don't know how many of you attended it, it's dead boring. And they just th throw around all sorts of buzzwords and, and vendor-specific things that don't make any sense if you don't know all the products. But it basically breaks down to a middleware, something, um, message buses, um, pipelines, processing pipelines, things like that, um, that come in various colors and um, price tags. And normally uh, are from, from any of, one of the big vendors like IBM or Microsoft or what have you, Oracle. Um, and um, they're really, really, really expensive. But if you actually look at what they do, they are nothing else than a glorified or not even glorified message queue. So it is really just message queuing that they do and put beautiful labels and nice graphs around it. So what's, what is actually a message queue? Um, a message queue is, in, in its basic form, nothing else than a stack and a routing mechanism around the stack and some, server interfa uh, some interface that can push information into that routing mechanism and the stacks, and some interface that can pull that information out again. Probably easier to look at a bit of code. Um, we have some information, we have some routing information, and we have some payload that we want to route to this location. And then we just send it off to the message queue. And a message queue routes it to that very location. And then we have some client code that just looks at the stack at that location in the message queue and processes whatever it gets. So that is a message queue in its very, very basic form. This routing information can become arbitrary complex if you have better message queues. Um, the whole consumer notion can be way more complex um, if we talk about how message queues can process messages in, in terms of if they just process it on a one-to-one -one basis or if they fan it out to all the consumers or if they um, do some funky stuff. So, but the, 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 very, the very basic notion is really just a stack. Stuff gets into the stack, stuff gets read out of the stack, and that's somehow taken care of that a, pro a message is only read once and all those kind of things that normally trip you up, they, they are being taken care of. Parallel execution. So if we take our, our idea from before that we have this, this bit of code where we do all sorts of requests and um, we want to we wanna speed it up, we can probably do it somehow like that. So we pass something and then we just fire off a request to our database and fire off a request to scale the damn image and call some external APIs and we don't actually care about any of the responses. We just fire all those requests off and then at the very last moment, before we render the page, we collect all the answers. Because only there, we're actually interested in all that crap. We don't need it before. We don't need to know if that scaling of the avatar actually worked till we actually render the page. So this is just taking all that ser uh, serial execution and all that synchronous code and 
truck it up into pieces where we know we don't need the side effects, we don't need the answers of the database queries until we render the page. We don't need, the, we need to know any of the crap we do up here until we actually render the page. And that way we can fire off way more information and par uh, process it in parallel and we only have to wait for the slowest one of them. So the slowest one of them is the determining time frame that we need for rendering the page. Asynchronous handling is really just send a request, wait for an answer, but while we wait, do something else. Do something else. And it's very natural. We always do something else while we wait. We don't just sit on our hands. So it is, it is from, from a personal perspective, something that is very, very natural. It is just our, our programming approach is currently more we do something serial because it's easier, because it's how we learned it initially, because how it's, it's how we sort of were brought up or so. <laughs> it's just we have to break out of that and, and do things more in a, in a human natural way and do things in more in more asynchronous way. So let's look at a couple of implementations of message queues because that's what we will use to actually do this asynchronous calls. AMQP is currently one of the most popular product, um, protocols, uh, in my view, for, um, for message queuing. Um, one of the, I think, best implementation is RabbitMQ. It's an erlang based um, server that does a lot of the scaling stuff for you and uh, does um, uh, a lot of uh, the redundancy things really, really nicely. It has a, a really nice routing engine and is really very stable. We didn't have any problems with it in production for pretty much three years now. Um, there is an Apache version of an AMQP server which is written in Java as far as I know and there is a couple of commercial options and they are all more or less interoperable. So you can, should be able to take up one client library, connect it to another server and it should just work. Um, there is ZeroMQ which is pretty new. ZeroMQ is um, a project of one of the guys um, but as it, uh, actually, the driving force behind the RabbitMQ development um, initially, um, he sort of went through that whole AMQP consortium thing where they have all the standardization happening. And so AMQP is a really robust standard that is, uh, has a lot of buy-in from the financial industry, from a lot of the big players in the market, even Microsoft is in there, I think. But there is uh, Red Hat is part of it as well, as, uh, as I'm aware, and a couple of other big ones. So there is there is massive buy-in from, from big vendors. And at some point, it was just too big for him, and he was like, okay, we, we're doing things way too corporate. Um, I actually want to cut it all down and, and do it from scratch, but this time real. And um, he, he sort of wrote the minimal viable message queue thing. And um, that is ZeroMQ. ZeroMQ is... Um, in its essence, really, it's just a library that does message queuing, but there is demons around it, and you can, uh, there is ties into pretty much every uh, popular programming language in the meantime. And uh, ZeroMQ is a sort of minimal approach. If you, you need message queuing um, on one server or a couple of servers, I wouldn't deploy it on, onto hundreds of servers, but uh, on, a, on a small scale, RabbitMQ, uh, ZeroMQ is a really, really interesting product. Um, and then there is a couple of Redis-based ones that I think are really, really interesting. RESC is one that was developed by the GitHub guys and is used in GitHub. Um, RESTMQ is a new one that has a, a REST interface into a message queue that is based on, on Redis. Um, so if you're starting out, look at those two. Um, they, they look promising. I haven't played with them, but I think they're really good approaches. Let's look at a real world, world example. How do we actually go from I have my monolithic serial execution uh, web application to I have an actual modular thing that scales very nicely and has asynchronous callbacks. So take a code base and try to figure out where, where am I calling external APIs or where am I calling code that is uh, adding a significant amount of time to my page rendering time. Um, take out everything that can actually happen in, in parallel and is not um, essentially front-end representation code. So you try to strip out everything that could run on its own without too much dependencies on your front-end and uh, also the stuff that, that is really adding time to your, to your page rendering. 
And um, then you take that code and put it out of, your, out of your existing web framework into a little daemon. And that little daemon can talk AMQP or any of the other protocols that you choose for, for interacting with your message queue. Um, this, this takes a moment for you to, to find a, a nice daemon framework. We have written daemonize, which is a really nice pull framework that does all that stuff already. It's on GitHub. Um, but there are many approaches to write little, little daemons in pretty much every language. PHP is probably an exception, but there is, there is stuff where you can actually execute PHP in a, uh, on a command line, which does daemon-like things. So even there you have, you have choices. Um, so you take that functionality and wrap it into a little daemon. And that daemon connects via AMQP back to your front end. And then you have to write in your front end a collector function. And the collector function sits there and waits for AMQP answers to come in. So you've stripped out the bits that take time and only have a stub function that calls it but it effectively sends off an AMQP request to your backend daemon. The, uh, the backend daemon processes it, someone sends back an answer, and the answer lands in the collector function. And they collect the answers at the last possible point and render it. That way, everything happens in parallel. It's even happening in different processes. So you don't have any interference with something that is really CPU intensive and chews up all the CPU in the backend. You can just We'll get in that, uh, into that in a moment. You can just track that on a different machine and then you can scale it that way. So we have now something that call, we have a front end, we have MQP in the middle, we have a back end, and we're talking to them. But what about caching? We could actually cache some of that stuff because pretty sure there are questions that come up or requests that come up every now and then and they're always the same. So we already know the answer because two users before, or even the same user on the previous site uh, page already, already requested that very information. So we can actually cache our answers. And um, I do it in Redis, but you can use any sort of key value in memory uh, storage uh, engine that uh, does uh, uh, caching. So what you actually do is, before firing off that, that request to, to AMQP, you actually fire it off to Redis, check if you have the answer already. If you have it, don't bother. If you don't, um, Push it into uh, push it into AMQP, and your 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 backend daemons start to respond to to the Redis server instead of the AMQP server. So your collector function actually starts to pull Redis instead of instead of AMQP. I'll show you pictures afterwards. Um, the I want my name architecture is heavily based on exactly what I've described in a moment, and um, this is where we ended up after a couple of years of development. Um, and many scalability errors <laughs> and things that went wrong. But um, this stuff is pretty stable now since a couple of months already and uh, we don't have any issues and it evolved in within the, the last three years roughly. This is, this is exactly the workflow that was, uh, I was describing. We have for, for pretty much any given command that we have in the backend, we're actually asking Redis if we have a cached answer that is relevant. If we do, we're just responding back. If we don't, we ask AMQP, we kick off a workflow, maybe, in the back end. Workflows are, um, I'll discuss it later as well, but workflows are, are very basic things or steps that wrap a couple of steps into one logic entity that we can call from the front end. And um, so depending on the complexity of the task, we either ask uh, a specific backend daemon or we ask a workflow daemon to actually kick off a workflow and give us a response. And uh, Redis respond, uh, and then we read the responses from Redis. So right after we kicked off all our MQP requests, we actually start to loop over um, over Redis uh, key and, and just wait till everything is there, and um, then render the page. So this is roughly how that looks like. We use Perl. I'm sorry for that. Um, we have Catalyst framework in the front. Catalyst asks RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ are um, Pushes it into a queue. Of those queues hang Perl and Erlang daemons that actually read this information, or they read workflows out of the couch, uh, out of CouchDB, um, where we have our, our workflow definitions, and then all of them reply back into Redis and Catalyst reads from Redis again. Does that make sense? 
Any questions so far? So, the workflow daemon. The workflow daemon is a very, 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 very basic thing. It does nothing else as take a workflow definition, which is a series of tasks, and uh, it's a simple fall through. Um, we go from, we know what we are doing in point one to hopefully know what we are doing in point two. In the moment we, we have some sort of undefined error stage, we're just breaking up, we're, we're stopping, we're not trying to recover at all. So we end up with, um, with, a, with a very, very simple engine that just, uh, that you fire a, a command off and, and a payload off to, and um, we try to do our best to actually process it, but if we can't recover, we're just, we're giving up. And um, we, we have a, a very easy way of recovering from those giving up points because we have um, intended giving up points where we just wait for external callbacks or for any sort of events to happen or uh, a time-based trigger, things like that, where um, we can recover that uh, callback, that workflow, and just continue processing it. A typical case, uh, case for, for a workflow is credit card processing, where you, have, uh, where you normally fire off a call to a credit card gateway, and then often you get a callback from them to your site that actually asks, uh, tells you, yes, this card is authorized, or yes, the CVC code was okay, or you actually have a fraud case, or stuff like that. And uh, in order to capture that in a nice way in, in, in a workflow, we send uh, the, the request off why, um, so the front end sends a request off via MQP, the daemon, first daemon processes it, the next daemon processes it. Someone we actually talk to the gateway and uh, the gateway comes back with everything's okay so far, but wait for the callback. So we pause the workflow at that stage, persist it into CouchDB, and that daemon is free to do something else in a moment. Because we're waiting, we don't have to keep it hanging there. Um, so somewhere we get the, front, uh, the callback via the front end, all the front end does is capture the URL and all the payload uh, and fire off another MQP request um, into our workflow. Our workflow engine detects a correlation ID, finds the workflow that has already started, continues the workflow, and we get a, uh, a response on the front end. And that whole stuff works fast enough that we can actually do it while the customer is on the website. So we can do really advanced workflow things in in um, in our backend, even in re in sort of real time, um, without uh, without having a lot of complexity to program all that stuff. If you have to program all the single steps that you do in a in a monolithic piece of code, it is really hard to get it right because of all the callbacks and the asynchronous way that actually happens already that you have to incorporate into your into your serial code. And um, another. The point is the replies. The replies don't really have to happen because um, a checkout workflow, for example, um, is a workflow where we register domains and do credit card transactions and do a logging and do all sorts of stuff. Um, we don't need the customer to wait for it. We just tell the customer, yes, we've taken your request and get him doing something else on our site before, um, bef uh, instead of having him waiting there for serial code to actually execute and do all those things and somewhere after half a minute or so tell him, yeah, everything is fine. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole workflow engine that we have in, in the backend um, to control multiple steps that happen um, during, during a single sort of execution command um, can be very, very uh, easily represented in the workflow. Um, one, one very, very, very big word of warning. <laughs> um, workflow engines can get really, really quickly very, very convoluted and um, you can waste millions. Um, I've seen really big corporate projects that wasted a lot of time on consultants um, to uh, implement really fancy method queues, uh, workflows. It doesn't work. Try to make it as easy as possible. What we do a lot is, um, especially for workflows uh, that are not responding, like uh, transfers, like a domain transfer is a workflow, where nothing happens for days till the transfer is actually coming back um, from the other registrar and is accepted and all, that, all those things. So um, there, is, there is workflows that just stall somewhere. Um, we have views onto our CouchDB that expose all the stalled or all the paused or all the, the broken workflows. Um, and we have different ways to quickly continue them or recover them or cancel them 
And the moment we find a pattern that happens more often, we either fix the code that triggers that pattern, or um, we write, uh, write a little daemon that actually processes that, that problem. So if it happens, we know an easy way to recover it. But this is iterative work as it happens. This is not something you spec out in the beginning and write for three months thousands of lines of code, and then you notice that case never happens. Um, so don't, don't try to be smart. Keep it really, really simple. So let's talk briefly about a couple of side effects that we have um, from, from that whole architecture. If you write your, your backend daemons really, really tiny and small, you can actually scale a backend function onto a single machine, onto a cluster of machines um, to, to get the performance out of uh, out of exactly that function. So if you have, for example, one function that scales images, you probably want to run it on, I don't know, five EC2 images that shut itself up and down and re uh, register itself in, in the server and all that is already taken care of because you can just bring up a, um, an instance and uh, an AMQP client connects to the AMQP server and that is the registration done. The moment that's there, it can start processing images and the moment you don't need it anymore, you shut it down. So you can scale re really, really easily um, on the fly as you, as you actually need the resources. Um, you can scale the backend independently from the front end. It's also very, very important. For example, if you have this big blog post happening about your site, everyone hits the front page, but probably no one goes further. So you only need to have your front page, uh, page cached well and, and enough servers that can actually withstand the traffic to actually serve the front page. And the backend is totally unimpressed from it because you don't need it. Um, so you, don't, you can only scale exactly those resources that you, that you need to scale in order to, to make the whole thing happen. You can also group CPU and memory intensive processes together and all those kind of things that you have um, if you have a selection of, of demons that you can cluster together. The workflow side effects. Um, come back to that early startup model. You, have, you, you, you run a startup and you have a very simplistic idea of what a checkout mechanism could do. It builds a credit card, registers a domain, sends something to the customer, done. Some when your uh, financial guys come and say, hey, accounting, uh, we should probably somehow track where we make money and where it goes. So uh, you plug in an accounting engine. And all you do is uh, really you write a daemon and then you write one line in your workflow definition where you say, hey, by the way, if everything went, uh, went well, send it off to the accounting engine. And um, that is all you do. You can really do that on the fly. You can add fraud detection on the fly. You can do all sorts of things that you can alter the, the, the workflow without restarting anything, without um, doing anything fancy, just by adding a couple of lines to your workflows, you can start routing your, your messages or change your, your workflow, your backend workflow, um, significantly without, without big problems. So, for the reading, I've done a, couch, uh, a talk about the workflow engine previously. It's called RabbitMQ and CouchDB is awesome. Um, it's somewhere on uh, SlideShare um, and also on my website somewhere. Um, I want my name infrastructure is another one that I've done about uh, specifically how, how our infrastructure is working and uh, it's also on SlideShare. And that's pretty much it. I hope I'm in time. Yeah. Questions? Way up the back. Uh, hello. Um, I'm basically rebuilding a whole, whole web stack in more or less the way you proposed. Um, however, um, we have a, a layer on the front, which is our web cache. So that would be primarily for the same kind of pages that get rendered over and over again. And we've got yep. a lot. Um, we've got half a million documents plus web documents plus all of the dynamic gener 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 generated stuff. Yep. So um, we're looking at using Varnish primarily, and that seems to be okay at the moment. Um, are there any other um, recommendations for front-end cache, like, like like Varnish, but you know. Varnish is very, very, very good. Okay, so configure <laughs> on the configuration for Varnish is uh, C and fun, and um, tools for managing that sort of thing. Have you seen anything like configuration management for that? 
We use Puppet for pretty much everything. Okay. Um, that's all of configuration management I'm aware of. We looked into Chef, looks really good as well, but it's really breaks down to writing a bunch of, a bunch of config files and deploy them automatically. So there is no fancy GUI or anything. Thank you. There Next question. There, there probably is a is a nice management interface for Varnish. I'm I'm just not aware of it. I, I've never used one. Now I get to pick on you in public. Um, I, I just want to go back to one of the early slides about Ajax, yeah. um, and you know the the point's well taken that you know Ajax is not. Uh, a cure-all by any stretch of the imagination. But the fact of the matter is there are a whole bunch of other arguments for it, um, especially when you're talking about rendering complex pages. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little about ways to mitigate the impact, you know, setting up and breaking down um, HTTP sessions and things like that. Yeah. Are, are, mm -hmm. are, you know, I, I know they do exist, so yeah. I'm just wondering if you can sort of go totally. through. Um, so first off, Ajax is absolutely fine if you use it in a sheltered environment um, or in an environment where you can control your, um, your page impressions. So the moment you're using it um, in an unsheltered environment where you can't control your page impressions and you have no way of quickly adding resources to your app server and actually scaling the demand if it, if it arises, only then you're in trouble. But um, there are a lot of, uh, there is uh, especially one really cool thing um, that uh, is around for the problem with Ajax requests or client-side scaling. Uh, I don't want to go into Ajax requests in, uh, especially, but client-side scaling can be done, um, for example, via Socket.io. Socket.io is absolutely cool. Uh, uses WebSockets where it can, uses uh, Comet long polling where it can, uh, if it can't use uh, flash sockets. Um, web sockets, uh, falls back to flash sockets if it has to, um, and uh, as a sort of last resort thing, uses um, Ajax polling. The advantage you have with that one is a connection setup from your browser to your app server happens exactly once, and after that, you have a standing connection where you can push back information to the browser. So you basically have a TCP connection in your browser and you can talk to it. And um, that gives you a lot of benefits in, so in terms of connection setup because an HX request, that's another nice side effect, an HX request takes a couple of milliseconds to actually set up because you have your browser here, you have your app server somewhere else. Um, a TCP handshake is a three-way handshake. Every HTTP request is actually a three-way handshake and then you start to push data back. So you actually have a significant lag at, uh, for every HX request you're doing. If you can cut down that lag and by in the same time also cut down the number of connections you're actually doing to your app server, you're really off to a good start. So uh, Socket.io is, is a really interesting thing to look into and I urge everyone who wants to play with WebSockets, don't do it with plain WebSockets, play with, uh, uh, with Socket.io, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. Um, can, you, can you share with us an example of the uh, workflow CouchDB document? Um, like what the structure inside is like? Um, I can, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, no. While we're waiting for that, here was the next uh, yeah. question. All right, if you can do two things at once. Um, in terms of handling errors, where not when you've got long delayed things like DNS, but you're, you're handing off something, but you want the answer pronto. Like in your example, you had a whole bunch of things that you wanted to get the answers to that you'd fed off. What sort of error handling is there? You know, if you've got some, it's on another machine, there's some sort of network problem, you're just not getting the answer. Do you have is it try catch? Is it timeouts? Timeouts. Yeah. The 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 easiest way to just deal with that is timeouts because you can't really catch an error. There is the the, the backend uh, an AMQP connection works in a way that you open up a channel and you push information into the channel and you close it. There is no RPC. RPC works with opening a second queue that you read the answers from and telling the message that you send in 
by the way, respond to that queue. So if you can't read anything out of that queue, there is no answer. So the only way you have to is, uh, is, is, a, is a timeout. There is, there is some sort of control in the AMQP protocol where you can make sure that the answers are that the request is actually processed on the other side. So um, depending on how you handshake your AMQP message on the, on the, on the consumer side, so on the, on the daemon in the back end, um, depending on how you handle that one, you can actually tell it, it something failed or uh, it worked. And uh, that is sent back to, to the client that's actually asking. But that handshaking can take a while because there may be 500 messages in the queue. So you normally don't want to do that. So can you set a flag saying these are reliable messages? Tell me if they didn't get through. You can define message uh, queues as uh, reliable or unreliable. And you can set, uh, um, define your, your actual connection that you do um, as I want to have um, acknowledges if the message was received or not. And on the consumer side, you can set, so that's all RabbitMQ, sorry. Um, I don't know how much of that spec is implemented in the other MQP servers. It's, I'm, I'm talking about RabbitMQ in a moment. Um, and on the, on the consumer side, you can define um, if you're auto-acknowledging every message you receive or if you want to man manually acknowledge a message that you receive. And what you normally want to do is you want to manually accept it after you've actually processed it. So you, you sort of read a message off the stack. In that moment where you read it off, it is blocked for every uh, other daemon. So it is basically off the queue. And then you process it. And if your processing worked, you acknowledge the, uh, the message. And um, only then it is really off the queue. If you don't acknowledge, uh, if you don't acknowledge it for any reasons, like your daemon died or anything like that, or you, you actually had a, had a database transaction that didn't um, go through and you had to roll back, um, you just not acknowledge the message and it uh, automatically goes back into the queue after a timeout. That timeout is configurable again. Um, I try to. I don't have the database on my local machine. I have it on my VM that it's not running. But uh, there is, um, if you look at SlideShare, where am I? Here. If you look at SlideShare and look for this talk, there is uh, example documents in there. And I'm happy to walk you through if you, if you have any questions. It is a very simplistic approach where you have a worker definition and you have um, a workflow definition. And the worker definition is nothing else than a queue and a command that you send to the queue. And um, the, the workflow definition takes the name of that worker and uses it in, in its workflow definition. It's, darn. it's really, really simple. <laughs> I just, no, I don't have the database on here. I don't even have a, a similar one. But I'm, I'm happy to show you afterwards. I've got two questions. Uh, yeah. The original overview diagram that you showed all the major moving bits, could you just give us a quick overlay of the physical deployment? Just sort of from a HA perspective, we can see what what components are there when things, you know, We're fail. currently running um, four front-end VMs. We are currently running two Redis caches, um, two RabbitMQ servers, and two servers that run backends and the backends we have pretty much all not really all but nearly all uh, backend demons running on two machines in parallel so we actually read off um, so it can be that a workflow is processed on one box and then on the other box is a second bit and the third bit is happening on the third box again so that, that um, is really just reading out of RabbitMQ for, um, for from queues and, and uh, RabbitMQ or, uh, automatically makes sure that the uh, message is only processed once. So from an HA perspective, um, well, how should be there two, two servers as well with multi-master replications that are just replicated in, in a circle? And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, the second part was you mentioned that your web framework is always asking Redis first to see if it's cached. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then it will initiate the queue to request then it should come back to the cache. Is the framework then just constantly polling, waiting for the cache to have, or is there some sort of trigger to you know, avoid 
pulling to death the, the you Redis You can cache. actually wait um, on a key in Redis. So you basically connect to it and wait for the key to happen. Okay. And the moment the key is there, you get a so response. So it'll, bl it'll block until yeah. it comes exactly. back. What about in the case of one of the processing servers is actually um, lost the connection to CouchDB, there's a network failure or something, um, in which case the MQ, all the requests are always going to time out because nothing will ever acknowledge. Are you going to then effectively bring your cluster into some sort of death spiral where it will constantly be requesting and nobody is all ever able to successfully... Can happen, but <laughs> <laughs> normally it shouldn't. Um, Rabidim, if a RabbitMQ box dies, it's very simple because RabbitMQ holds the queues on, uh, on both Rabbit, uh, Rabbits uh, in sync. One on, on disk if, uh, if it's a persistent queue and the other one in memory so uh, that you get speed out of it. Or if it is a fire and forget queue where you don't really care about the data, you, you keep them both in memory. So you have redundancy here. Um, if one of those ones dies, it's really, really simple because they don't, they are not registered in here anymore. So they wouldn't get any requests. So all the requests get routed to, to the still alive box. So that one is self-organizing. The moment that one comes up again, it starts to register its demons in, in RabbitMQ again and they come up and, and start to process messages. So the case I'm talking about is not that the demons have failed, they're still there, they're still registered, but they themselves, they can't complete the process. For example, they can't contact a, the, the CouchDB or they ah, can't contact okay. something. So they, they in turn have failed. They're still there, ready, yeah. accepting requests. Um, they're not going to respond to MQ with a, a valid response. Yeah. It will time out and another request will come through, which in turn will fail because the underlying error is still there. Hence, are we going to go into some sort of death spiral waiting for something yeah. that can never succeed? In that moment, um, you start to accumulate messages in the queue because we can't acknowledge the queues any, uh, we don't acknowledge the tickets anymore. And um, the, that demon would, every demon would basic, uh, that processes one queue would start to fill up with one message it can't process it and can't get rid of, uh, can't acknowledge it as well. So uh, RabbitMQ would just start queuing all new messages in the queue, which has the same effect, it, it times out. Um, but our monitoring would pick up a growing queue and uh, we would get pages and would be made aware of that problem and uh, would need to fix the underlying problem with, uh, I don't know, external API that doesn't respond anymore, or things like that. So you have to set up monitoring around that stuff. And uh, a growing queue is always, a rapidly growing queue is always a bad sign. Got a couple of questions up the back. Um, how does uh, Rabbit uh, MQ compare to Cupid? Do you know of Cupid? I know of Cupid, but I have never played with it. I'm sorry. Um, with things like RabbitMQ, it seems great for, for known processes, so things that are repeatable repeatable and, and done often. Think, um, in an environment I've got, uh, we get unique jobs that run for a long time, um, but we do need those results, so we block for a hell of a long time. Um, can something like a message queue be involved at the moment? We throw it off to a grid, wait for that to come back um, through there, but is there any way you could see using something like a message queue could assist in that? Absolutely. Um, so if you have a, a, a long running job um, that blocks for a long time and you're interested in the responses, it's, um, it's very... So do, do you have a web fr uh, front end to that or do, wh what sort of tasks are you talking so about? Build tasks probably or something like that. Yeah, they're unique tasks that come in, so you, know, you might have a thousand in a day, they're totally different. So yeah. and then get a result back. So in that sense, um, they're unique. There is a web front end, so you can see status, mainly if it's yeah, pass, fail, and yeah. then get, go collect the result and set. So the scenario is basically you have a lot of processes and uh, they long for, run for a long time and you're interested in the, in the responses and the status codes that they actually emit. Um, in that case, I would, um, I would write workers as many as you can handle physically on the box to process um, things off the queue and um, just run them in parallel as, as many as you can afford. Um, and the, the last step of, of every processing is uh, to push 
the status onto some sort of stack, either Redis or in a database or whatever, and then you actually read the database. Because um, you don't want to, or, or you use WebSockets, totally. Um, with WebSockets, you can just have a standing connection to, to a WebSocket backend and then just push the updates to the WebSocket server, and the WebSocket server would update the website in real time. Next question. 15, we still have a bit of time. Yeah. yeah we've got time. Do you have any interactions between your backend services, between your, your Erlang and your Perl guys? And if so, is that mediated by your workflow engine or do you use some other mechanism? Thanks that you ask. Um, we actually run a sort of generic protocol between all the bits here, which is a JSON object. Couldn't be easier. Um, so we have a, a specially formatted JSON object that has a, a header section or a meta section and um, a data section and a response section. And all we do is pushing JSON objects between daemons. And if we for some reason can't process something which has persisted into CouchDB, which takes JSON objects again. So it is a very natural match, and it is very simple to persist and unpersist stuff into and from CouchDB. Um, and in Erlang and in Perl, we, we, we never interact directly. We always interact via RabbitMQ. So all those demons all read off a queue. And uh, every time we need something else to happen, um, we just push a message onto the queue and either that process is waiting for the answer itself, so we do sort of RPC calls via RabbitMQ, or that call is just pausing and uh, it's a workflow that is actually pushed around in circles or pushed around in various parts. So we are always talking serialized JSON objects. So just to clarify, the the responses don't go back through RabbitMQ? Most of them don't. Um, if we do a direct, re a direct request for something that um, we know it can't be cached, and we know um, the workflow name for it, or we know the, the, the outcome sort of is really very, very specific to exactly that process, um, we can tell it to respond directly. Um, if we, so basically the, the, one of the fields in the meta section is uh, cached or not. And if, if the request is cached, um, the daemon knows, send it to Redis. If the cache flag is not set, send it back to RabbitMQ. And that way we can control on a per message basis if we want to have a direct response or if we want to have a cache response. So on the front end, you've got two, two instances of the Rabbit client, one as a publisher, one as a consumer. Yes. Um, Catalyst is a long-running um, process, so the first thing Catalyst does is sets up um, a connection uh, to RabbitMQ, and uh, RabbitMQ does multiplexing for, for connections, so you, you have a connection set up once, and then you have so-called channels um, that multiplex connections within one TCP connection so that you don't have the overhead of a TCP connection setting up and all those kind of things. And then via that one we just uh, set up a, a response channel per request, basically. Okay, well, it's uh, just about lunchtime, so we'll call the end of the questions there. So uh, thank you very much, Lens, for a very <laughs> clear and concise talk. Thanks. And the Linux conference would like to present you with a, a small um, glass and gold uh, penguin as a memento of this occasion in your talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>